Welcome to our series on Mother Mary as we approach Mother's Day. This first topic is in the School of Virtues with Mother Mary. And we'll begin, of course, with the prayers. So if you'll join me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, most blessed Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone has fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was up the native. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin, O Virgins, my mother. To you do I come, before you I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother, the Word incarnate, despise not our petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so first we want to ask, why the virtues in this school of virtues, so to speak, what's so important about it? And second, then why Mother Mary of all people? So first we'll look at the virtues. Now, why the virtues? Well, we understand what is our purpose in life. And going back to that grand question, we all know that we want to be saints, that we want to be with the Lord in heaven. But to be a saint then, we need to conform our lives to Christ. And to conform our lives requires two things. First is to live a sacramental life with Jesus. And second is to live the moral life that he calls us to. Now, the sacramental life, when we're not in this pandemic, in this quarantine, is pretty, it's not difficult to do because our churches are, are very generous in offering the sacraments. But the moral life, now that is a lifelong battle. And that's something that we can all improve on just because, let's face it, we all sin. So the idea then is to focus on how we can improve the moral life by looking to prime models. And that's where we go to Mother Mary. So why Mother Mary? Well, of all people, we know that after Jesus Christ himself, she is the best, the next best person. Because she is the mother of God. She gave birth to Jesus and by immaculate by her immaculate conception, knowing that she was without original sin, she becomes the golden standard. And so when we look at and study her life, we can see exactly how we are called to live. So for that very reason, we have in the School of Virtue, a key lesson today on how to live the virtues by Mother Mary. So what we'll do for today is to first focus on the, basically the framework of what the virtues look like in, in both the Aristotelian telos or his mode, and then second in St. Thomas Aquinas's uh, formal principles. And then after that, we will look at Mother Mary's school and how she chooses to teach. What is her mode of, of educating? And so this is going to be very exciting, and we're going to jump right in. So first we begin with Aristotle's telos, also known as the Aristotelian mode. Now there are three parts to this. There is the norms, or, or so it's the norms, or the, or the law. And then you have the means, which for us is the virtue. And then you have the goods, also known as the end. So when you focus on the law or the norms these are basically our structure our foundation that protects the justice in which we know what's right and wrong and when we have this it is then that we can approach whatever good we seek with the proper means with total confidence because we are being protected by these laws these norms and then you have the means, how we get to that good or that end. Um, and basically the virtues help forge us to give our very best in pursuing this end, this goal. And of course, the good or the goal then for us is heaven, is to be conformed to Christ, is to finally have that beatific vision. So we have all these things in the Aristotelian telos, but I'll use an example to give us a better understanding of how to approach it. Or before I do, I'll first introduce 
St. Thomas's formal principles. So St. Thomas Aquinas shares um, that there are four factors in approaching the Aristotelian telos, and he calls this the formal principle. So the first part of the formal principle is to know the goal and the means of achieving it. Or you can also call it the good, knowing the good or the goal. Second is creating or choosing a plan to attain that goal. Because we know that there's so many different ways to approach it. So what is the choice that is best for us? Third is being resolute and handling any challenges that might keep us from reaching that goal. And finally is moderating inclinations on our own end that prevent us from achieving that intended goal. So when we see these formal principles, we can apply them and I'll just share an example on how to apply them. So I used the image of a, a freeway or a highway. So when you have a freeway, you have your boundaries, right? So this is the, the law and, or the, yeah, the law and the norms. And they're basically the dividers. So they protect us from crashing or going into the other side where we have incoming traffic. Um, so it keeps us all going in one direction and it divides us so that we don't accidentally cross lanes and hit each other. And when we have these boundaries, it gives us a security so that we can go to our final destination with confidence. So we don't have to concern if the other people are going to affect us. And then second is then to choose a plan to attain the goal. Now, what is my vehicle of choice? Now the vehicle then is for us that means, so it's the virtue. What virtues do I need to exercise to get to this goal, right? And so when you exercise, if, if you're a virtuous person, you're going to drive a nice vehicle and it's gonna get you there faster or better in, in, in better comfort or it's easier. Um, and when, you, when you're not very virtuous, it's a lot more difficult to get to uh, that, that goal because you don't have good fortified habits. Um, if you don't take care of your car, it starts falling apart. And then you have being resolute and handling the challenges to the goal and moderating inclinations. So this is both not being tempted to check your phone, right? That's moderating, moderating the inclinations and being resolute, making sure that you are attentive to on the, the, the drivers beside you in case they're not being focused for whatever reason, because maybe they were praying too hard. <laughs> I don't know. But so within that framework, then we have the Aristotelian uh, telos being approached with this formal principle of how we're going to get there. Again, it's to know the goal and know the means, the virtues of how to get there. And then it's to choose a plan which virtues do I need to get there? And then it's to be resolute in handling whatever challenges arise with the goal. And it's also to avoid those inclinations that we might have, our own personal temptations. Good, so now that we have an understanding of the framework for virtue, let's look at it now through the perspective in Mother Mary's school. So I say Mother Mary's school because different People have different means of teaching, and there are three main types of teaching. Now, the first, and I would say, and I say, so I'll share in um, order from least effective to most effective, but the least effective means of teaching, namely the virtues, but oftentimes the most common means of teaching, specifically in, in the dynamic of the home or in, in like a social environment is by lecturing, which is exactly what we're doing. And I say this is the least effective because it affects a certain part of our, um, our intellect, but 
it doesn't really affect our memory in a way that challenges us in in our environment the same way that other means will and i'll share that in a moment so parents when their children misbehave for example are tempted to lecture them to scold them to say they did wrong and then many times it ends there that's that's it and they just leave them be but the second most effective way or the second mode is to give experience and this is where the person who's trying to teach the virtue gives responsibility to their pupil or whoever they're teaching and by giving responsibility they give them an opportunity to exercise that particular virtue they're trying to teach by creating an environment to provide that lesson and so when someone personally goes out and learns or exercises that virtue um, by, by practice, they're actually living it out. And so that's a very effective way to do it because virtue is namely the repetition of good habit. And so long as they keep this going, hey, they're, they're in the process of mastering the virtue. But perhaps the most effective approach to teaching the virtue is example. An example means that rather than talking the talk, we walk first, okay? And so this is what Mother Mary does. She teaches us by example. When we read in Holy Scripture, we don't read her lecturing Jesus on what is perfect love, on what being humble looks like. It would be rather absurd if we were to read that um, if we didn't see it by her example. But rather than using any lecture of any sort, that's not even in the picture, that's out of the question. She only teaches us by her hidden humility. And only for those who are interested in learning from her, we can read between the lines and we can really focus on how she teaches by her actions by the way that she lives her life, by whatever, she, whatever is said from her heart and from her, her physical mode of being that is between the dialogue. And so this is important for us because she teaches us in a heroic way what is written all over the stories the stories about her. Now concerning stories, when we read folklore or fables or myths, oftentimes they look at a hero who is an adventurous hero. And the good thing for children is that when they read about an adventurous hero, they see someone who really taps into their imagination and inspires by taking them into uh, the, this place. But for the adult, the challenge is that the adventurous hero, which is nice um, as, as a good story, doesn't apply practically to the common day hero. And the common day hero is the one who, in the most ordinary of life, continues to practice the virtues, namely by continuing to persevere in what's difficult and what's not pleasing and and modeling the virtues in that way but the beauty about mother mary's life is that her life in her in her story is both both adventurous and common ordinary so she is a hero in both of those regards and for that reason she's the perfect example because she teaches everyone whether you're a child whether you're an adult or whether you're a grand adult and so for her school i would like to look at how she teaches by two things one is approaching a particular virtue and seeing how she can teach us through different scenes in her life that virtue 
or second, by looking at a particular scene and seeing the various virtues that come to us through that scene. So the virtue that I picked for us today is one of my favorites, but it's solertia. And St. Thomas Aquinas uses this Latin term solertia uh, to teach what he calls shrewdness. And Joseph Pieper expands on this. Let me see here if I could find it. He says that solertia is the capacity for instantly grasping an unexpected situation and deciding with extreme quick wittedness to be one of the components of perfect prudence. So again, it's that clear-sighted objectivity in, in the spur of a moment and in, in the face of the unexpected. And it's to make a, a decision, you know, it's not rash because in the moment, you're using all the best of your knowledge to make a right judgment and to move on with it. Now, just to see how that applies in a practical uh, demonstration, I would say uh, this is a terrible example, but just, you know, if you imagine you're with friends and you decide to get a meal together and perhaps your friends forgot their wallet and you just need to make a decision rather than going through Yelp for the next 15, 20 minutes, trying to decide which type of cuisine is going to satisfy your friends and what's not too expensive. You just see um, a very simple Chinese restaurant across the street. So you say, all right, guys, we're doing it. Chinese, who's with me? And they get to make a choice because you made a clear choice. Either they join you or they don't. That's Salertia because you recognize the situation. Um, you recognize both the economic situation and the social situation. And you made a quick witted judgment. But how does Mother Mary show us by her example what Salertia looks like? I would point us to, um, I think, I mean, just a prime example is the Annunciation. So when we look at the Gospel of Luke in the very beginning, we see when Angel Gabriel appears to her and first presents to her the future, that she is to give birth to a son and she is to name him Jesus. She asks just to clarify between the preternatural and the natural how this is going to be possible because she doesn't have relations with a man. She has no husband. But the angel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power will overshadow you and a child will be born and will be called Holy, the Son of God. So in this moment, she assess and she doesn't hesitate. She doesn't complain. She makes this response. Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And with that, the angel departed from her. That's Salertia. Wow. The whole world, all of salvation is hinged on those words that are about to come out of her mouth. And rather than complaining, like, what? You're expecting me to do this? Or rather than, you know, um, making it all about her, like, wow, I am the woman. God chose me. No, instead she says, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. So what's beautiful is with Solertia, it requires a certain self-knowledge. And with that self-knowledge, she humbly presents herself as nothing more than the Lord's handmaid. The servant of God, our, the servants of the servants. And she says, let it be done to me according to thy word. What's beautiful about this is when she says this, she models for us what our humility should look like. Solertia requires tremendous humility. And when we think of how Jesus later on in life responds to the Lord's will, 
we see that there was probably a tremendous amount of learning from Mother Mary in his humanity. Because we see, you know, later on, Jesus says, whoever sees me sees the Father. Um, I do the Father's will. And he, he also says um, specifically about uh, having to pick up our crosses, to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross and to follow him. But because this isn't following him, but it is following the, the one who sent him, God the Father. And so this is a good example of recognizing how Mother Mary shows us that quick-wittedness to make right judgment, even in the most unprecedented circumstances. Like this is beyond belief. This is impossible, but God can always make the impossible possible, and he does. And then the second part is for us to see, you know, I think, for example, in the wedding at Cana, Mother Mary, when she sees those urns empty without wine, has to make a very quick decision. Rather than complaining, <laughs> you know, sometimes there's a temptation for mothers to complain and turn to their sons and say, do something about it, right? But Mother Mary doesn't complain. She doesn't complain. She says, son, they have no wine. This is amazing because she says it with a certain humility that gives him total freedom to make whatever decision he wants. He told her, you know, it's not my time. After he said that, he could have just stepped back and let it be. And hey, if he did that, then, it would, you know, we just, that would be, that would be fine. But, um, of course, out of his tremendous love for us, he went ahead and performed that first miracle. But Mother Mary, we can read between the lines. Because in this scene, in this moment, while there were probably like a hundred people gathered in this wedding feast in this banquet and other people probably might have seen the urn empty they might have just kind of passed by or maybe even felt like they would need to drink more wine because they don't want to be sober when the party is dry you know for whatever reason but mother mary seeing it doesn't neglect it she handles it and she finds quickly what is the best way to address this problem. How can she pour out her love for this couple and to make sure that they are able to have the sacrament of a lifetime that they'll remember forever? And she acts quickly on it. And she turns to the servants and she tells them, do whatever he tells you. Now there is tremendous confidence there. So she looks at the situation and she, with her shrewdness, with her quick wittedness, makes a judgment and, and, and places her confidence in her son. So she teaches us in that example, right? In that example, not by lecturing us, but by showing us what we can do when we want to approach her son, Jesus, and when we need to make a quick decision when we don't have time to, to think things through carefully and we just need to do our best to follow our conscience that we've rightly prepared for this moment to do what's right. So the other part to approaching Mother Mary's school is again, focusing on a particular scene. I mean, I, I've kind of done that, but to see all the different virtues that speak in that particular scene. So rather than focusing on one virtue, we focus on one scene and we allow for all the virtues to manifest. Now, for, for brevity's sake, I'll just focus on um, the presentation of our Lord Jesus in the temple of Jerusalem. And we can just quickly imagine Mother Mary you know, she's standing there in line, and she's there with these two doves. Now, point taken, she's following out of obedience everything that is according to the purification rituals in, in Judea at the time. But all that's to say, she didn't have to do it. 
I mean, validly, being the mother of God, being without original sin, as we know through her immaculate conception, she did not have to go through the purification process because she's already pure. I mean, she had no relations. But what we understand is this is how she teaches. And she chose to stand in that line and to follow whatever um, the whatever laws the society has. And, and by doing that, she humbly submits. And this is something that Jesus follows as well. Because think about Jesus's baptism. Jesus did not have to get baptized, but he chose to do it in order to bring us into our Lord's, our Lord's family as his children. But Mother Mary, so she teaches us by this particular moment. And we can think of all the virtues there. There's humility, there's obedience, there is prudence, so as not to start a scene with all the other women, to, to stir jealousy. There is tremendous um, fortitude, patience, and, and the list can go on and on. But the beauty for us is that with Mother Mary in her school, Anyone can learn the virtues. You don't have to be a moral theologian. The layman can really become a master of the virtues just by spending this quality time with her. So this is a great time during the month of May to spend these next days, these, next, this, these weeks, really contemplating all the scenes in her life and to seeing in what ways she can help us to strive to be better in those particular virtues that will help us to master ourselves. And in doing so, we forge our nature and um, open the doors for God's grace to flow in evermore. So that's it for today. And um, please join us for our next talks on the series, especially with the rosary and getting to know Mother Mary as our mother. God bless you. And We'll see you next time.